A reading from the second book of Samuel. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go forth to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking upon the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am with child. So David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing, and how the people fared, and how the war prospered. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. Then they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house. And David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk, and in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him that he, might, he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite was slain also. The word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus said to the crowds, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed upon the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should sprout and grow, he knows not how. The earth produces of itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. And he did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples he explained everything. The Gospel of the Lord. Today we celebrate the feast of St. Thomas Aquinas, a saint particularly dear to my own heart. I don't think there is a, a saint who has affected my own uh, thinking more than, than St. Thomas Aquinas. I was introduced to him when I was at seminary and when most people groaned when they saw the Summa Theologica, <laughs> I came alive, I, I loved it, I thought it was wonderful. Um, I thought it was beautiful because there was such coherency to all of his thought and that made sense to me. If the truth is one, if Christ is one, then the fact that theology and philosophy should have a definite unity around Christ, um, I just thought that really struck me as being particularly uh, a sound way to do theology. And also what is very evident in his work is his love of the Eucharist and his love of scripture. Um, and so I was deeply impacted by, by both. And he was commissioned by the church for two works, one particularly Eucharistic and another particularly regarding scripture. The mission he was given by the Holy Father for scripture was because it was post-Reformation and there had been many, uh, many twistings of the word, if you will, in order to fit with particularly uh, erroneous or heretical thoughts. What the Holy Father wanted was, uh, as he asked St. Thomas Aquinas, to collect all of the works or the patristic insights, the works of the church fathers, um, on the different passages in the gospel, um, and to put those all together so that the church could return again to those sources, those patristic insights, and then develop again her interpretation from there. And so even though he is uh, at times critical of those insights that we see in his own scriptural commentaries, uh, it shows that we always begin with the church fathers, even though even some of their interpretations, as he disagrees with some of them, uh, he shows that we go back in humility to see the way in which the church fathers approached the scriptures, the particular type of way in which they approached them and the particular type of way in which they interpreted them, um, and then to build from there. And so, uh, so he, he put those works together. He also then has his own commentaries on the Gospel of Matthew and John and various other books of Scripture, um, which at times can be uh, long and, and, uh, and tedious, but at other times you find real beautiful insights and gems into understanding the Word, into understanding Jesus Christ. And so he had a very obvious, if you read through his writings, a very obvious uh, love and devotion uh, to our Lord, and it is evident in what he writes. But also his delicacy when approaching the mystery of the Eucharist is also very profound. And so he also is responsible for the beautiful liturgical prayers and a lot of the Eucharistic hymns that surround the Feast of Corpus Christi, which is also what the Holy Father um, took from his, his, his writings. And so the church then uh, puts forward his prayers because of his love of the Eucharist. Uh, that love is very evident in the prayers and hymns which he wrote for the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And I think that that's then interesting if we look at the the gospel for today. So the Lord is addressing the same multitude. He's spoken to them the parable of the sower. 
And in the parable of the sower, he, sh he is focusing particularly on the ground which receives the word. And so we can see there are different types of ground in which the word is unable to grow, but there is one type of ground, the good soil, in which the word is able to take root. But now he shifts, he shifts from the ground to the seed. He shifts from the, uh, the receptivity of the ground to the power and the life that is contained within the seed that is given to this ground. And so he says, what is the kingdom of God like? It is like a man which scatters seed into the ground and he sleeps and he rises and the seed grows and he does not know how. And so this aspect shows that the power of the word is something from within itself. It has a potency within it, a potency of life a life that was, is, is in all sense hidden. When you look at a seed, it is dry and it appears to be arid and devoid of life. But in the ground, it begins to grow and it grows in a particular way. First the blade, then the ear, then the full grain, then the harvest and the fruitfulness. And so it shows that there is a, pr a process of reception of the word into good soil, but then there is also a life in the word that takes root and grows in the soul. And it is the beautiful power of the word, this word that is living and active, when we allow it into good soil, into the good soil of our hearts, hearts that love Christ, that are filled with his grace, then it can begin to grow even of its own accord. It can work within us, this living word that is able to be alive and active within us. And it is able to produce a harvest within us, what this means is that it pushes us to the perfection of charity, a charity, charitable works. When the word informs the things that we do, then we know that we are acting according to God's will. And so this harvest is the fullness of charity, a charity that has come to perfection, but a charity that began in the word, a life that began in the word, a life that began in hiddenness. And so he shows that the word has power and life. But then also we sh she shows by the next example that it has a particular also, not just for life, but also the same, if you will, one of the church fathers says, just like mustard has such a powerful potency to it. So also the word also has this intensity to it. And so it brings an intensity of life, not just life itself, it is life in abundance. And it might appear to be the smallest but it is the most powerful. And then we see, so not only does the word bring life and potency, but it also brings rest. The beautiful image that the Lord uses here is he says that it puts forth its branches and the birds of the air can rest in it. Birds of the air, that is such a beautiful image for what is the human soul, what is a human person. A bird, when it is flying, is not at rest, it is in action, it is in its activity. It is only at rest when it lands. And so also, as the birds here find rest in this tree that has grown from the word, so also our souls find rest in the understanding that comes from the word. When the word has grown in us by its own life, when the understanding has been given, our soul can find rest in that truth. The word brings peace, not only life, not only potency, but it brings rest and peace to our souls. And where does this happen? Well, we see from the gospel that this happens when we are alone with Christ. The Lord speaks in parables to the multitude, but he explains everything when he is alone with his disciples. It shows us the importance of personal prayer with Jesus, time alone with him, giving time alone to his word and our mind over to his word and to the scriptures so that we can enter into a conversation with him that brings understanding. But the other thing that we see here is that it is privately with his own disciples. So it is individual and privately with them, but it is also within the context of the church. The church is the authority which defines the scriptures. The church is the authority which teaches the scriptures. 
And so all of our own personal prayer with the scriptures and with the word always sits under that authoritative uh, key for interpretation of the church. And so it is another reason why we begin first with the church fathers and then take in the example and the commentaries of the saints over the years so that we can be filled with the church's own understanding of scripture and that that understanding can become our own. And so as we are still moving on from the beautiful Sunday of the word, we are encouraged in this week to consider the word, not only in the reception in our own souls and the good soil of our souls, but also in the power of the word itself, the life of the word itself, and the beautiful peace and rest that it brings to us. Amen.